thrown on this fire. The fire was taken off of the altar that was out in the out in the outer court. So whatever a person may think about that kind of activity, keep the incense flowing, keep the light burning, keep the bread on the altar, it was serving God. That was serving God. In effect, it was keeping the people constantly in God's remembrance mm -hmm. all the time. God wanted to be kept. You want to see this about God now. God wanted to be kept. He wanted his people to be in his remembrance all the time. Because he knew they, if they weren't, he wouldn't minister to them. See, God doesn't minister to people that aren't in his mind. And so this was a way of keeping the people constantly in his mind. So you notice this phrase, minister in the holy place. Exodus 35, 19 says this, the cloths of service... To do service in the holy place. The holy garments for Aaron the priest and garments for his sons to minister in the priest's office. So here you wore special clothes when you're in here. This holy place. Exodus 39, 41 says the same, says the same thing. The clothes of service to minister in the holy, in the holy place. Now I know about these special clothes. They were exclusively for ministry. Now, there are some in the world, there are some occupations that you wear special clothes. When you, when you have the occupation, we wear special clothes. If you are in a hospital, a nurse has to have special, special clothes they wear when they do their nurse work. If you are a chemist in some laboratories, you are required to wear special clothes, special paraphernalia. Mm -hmm. Here in God's service, they wore special clothes. Exodus 40 and verse 13 Thou shalt put upon Aaron the holy garments and anoint him and sanctify him that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. Exodus 40, 14 says, And thou shalt bring his sons and clothe them with coats. So they were at full covering. <clears throat> no part of their uh, person was showing, so to speak. I've thought about this often, although there's no particulars in Scripture about it, but they were traveling in a desert area. And it was not, I've been in that particular area, it's not a nice, cool place. This was very enclosed, no windows, <laughs> curtains all around it, thick boards on the side of it, and they had a lot of coats and clothes and coverings on their head, ministry, <laughs> ministry in here. In other words, when they were in here, like God didn't want any of them showing. He wanted special, special paraphernalia showing. Which is a picture, quite a picture of the robes of righteousness being clothed with putting on Christ. When you come in God's presence, you want as little of yourself showing as is possible. Amen. You want to have a lot of Christ showing in you. And you can, you can have. Let me be encouraging. You can have. Because in salvation, you, you are provided garments just as surely as these priests were provided garments. See, God gave women special skills and men to make these garments. So they, he, he provided the garments. And they just had to put them on. And the same as in salvation. Special clothes to minister. Clothe yourself with all humility of mind, the scripture says. See, you put a certain things you put on when you come before the, before the Lord. And there, was, uh, there were special blue cloths associated with this, with this uh, holy place. This is Numbers, the fourth chapter, in verse 7. Upon the table of showbread they shall spread a cloth of blue. It's quite, quite something. And put there, there on the dishes, the spoons, the bowls, and covers to cover with all. And the continual bread shall be there on. So on this table there was a beautiful blue cloth spread over this. It was covered with pure gold, you know, the table itself with a crown around it. And there were bowls and spoons and things to mix and make the bread. <coughs> Put that all in place. All this is now is in the holy place. None of this is outside. The point I'm making here is that what's inside the holy place. And there were certain people that had the oversight of this structure here. Their job was to keep everything in order here. Numbers 1 and verse 50. Thou shalt appoint the Levites over the tabernacle of testimony. That phrase tabernacle of testimony. The ark of the covenant was the actual testimony. He's called it ark of the testimony. So the tabernacle primarily was a place where the ark and the covenant and the mercy seat was. There are those appointed over the tabernacle of testimony and over all the vessels thereof and over all the things that belong to it. They shall bear the tabernacle and all the vessels thereof. They shall minister unto, unto it 
angelic camp round about the tabernacle. So here was a group of people, and their job was live by this place. You live, you live in the immediate area of this camp. You didn't camp in Samaria and foot it over here every morning. See, sometimes some we have to work places. We have to go a long way to get there. I used to, when I was uh, working, had to drive, you know, 30, 30 some miles to work one way. Well, you couldn't do that here. You had to live right there, right next to it. You had to work there. And when the tabernacle, when the congregation <clears throat> moved, this, these, this tribe of people had to take it down, put it together, carry it. When they stopped, unpack it, put it up. <laughs> it was all that. It was their job. There's a, John's teaching us that there's some... There's things associated with him that his people are supposed to do. There's special like occupations that they do in the Lord. Oversight of it. So it wasn't left. They didn't hire anybody to do this. There's a special people to do this. We're going to make a parallel eventually that the holy place, that's, that's like parallels like the, the church. This is where the priests general minister. Like us, we're priests. The holiest place, that's where the high priest ministered, or in our case, where Jesus ministered. So this is, this is going to tell us a lot about the environment in which we serve, serve the Lord. Now the ministry, when you're in here in this area, they serve me in the holy place, minister to me in the holy place. So let's look briefly at that. There's certain things then associated with where you minister. There's a certain environment that has to characterize it. The first is it has to have illumination. Candlestick was in there. If you're going to serve God, you have to have, do it in the light. You can't do it in the darkness. To put it another way, you can't minister to the Lord or be His servant in a state of ignorance. It has to be in a state of illumination. Exodus 25, 37, speaking of this golden candlestick, says, Thou shalt make the seven lamps thereof, they shall light the lamps thereof, that they may give light over against it, or let's say all around it, we would say. Exodus 27, 20, Thou shalt command the children of Israel that they bring thee pure oil, olive, beaten for the light, to cause the lamp to burn always. This that lamp had to be burning all the time. Couldn't be turned the light on, turn the light off. It wasn't like that. Had to be that way all the time. All the time. And secondly, there was an was environment of nourishment, the food. There was food set before them. Now, this food stayed on this table for seven days. And then on the seventh day, you changed the twelve loaves and the priests ate the older ones. That's, that was the procedure. God got the, first, God got the fresh bread. You got the seven-day-old bread. That's, that's the way it was arranged. It's like a mentality. It's like a mentality that he's developing. God gets the freshness, the first, you get it after that. That's, that's the principle. So the bread was there. Exodus 25 verse 30 says, Thou shalt set upon the table of showbread before me always, always. This bread had to be before him. Leviticus 24 5, Thou shalt take fine flour and bake twelve cakes thereof, Two tenth deals shall be one cake. Be in the rough area of a, about a pint of flour and oil mixed per cake. Thou shalt set them in two rows, six on a row, upon the pure table before the Lord. A row in this case would be a vertical row, two stacks of six. And thou shalt put pure frankincense upon each row. It has to be fragrant. That it may be on the bread for a memorial, even an offering made by fire to the Lord. That is, the bread had to be baked. Every Sabbath he shall set it in order before the Lord continually, being taken from the children of Israel by an everlasting covenant. So he takes the flour, the oils that the Israel supplied, makes the cakes, set them before the Lord all the time. The priest is responsible for it being there. You couldn't come in. And, and one Sabbath, the man forgot to change the bread. <laughs> you just couldn't do this. You just couldn't do this. Now you think of, uh, you read in Scripture that when they were journeying through the wilderness, there was not a sick man among them. You remember you reading this? Wasn't a lame person among them. Remember reading this sort of thing? Have you ever connected that with the tabernacle? What if the Levites' flu broke out? 
among the Levites so they couldn't serve in the tabernacle. You see, it tells, kind of tells you why God kept them in a state of wellness all the time when they were traveling along. So there was bread in there, and there was fragrance of pleasing odor in there that he emitted from the altar of incense. As mentioned in Exodus 30, verse 1, Thou shalt make an altar to burn incense upon. Exodus 30 and verse 7 says, Thou shalt burn thereon sweet incense every morning. When he dresses the lamps, he shall burn incense upon it. So when dress the lamp meant trim the wicks and keep it so it kept burning, didn't go out. I think of a wick as something like a, what's in a candle and it would get charred and you'd have to cut it off so the flame would, wouldn't go out. Trim that. At the same time you do that, keep the, keep the incense, sweet incense, so it's, it's pleasing. It's a pleasing fragrance. Leviticus 16.12, He shall take a censer full of burning coals from off the altar, that's the altar in the outside, before the Lord, and his hands full of sweet incense, beaten small, and bring it within the veil. This case was the veil that separated the holy place from the outer court. Bring it within the veil. He shall put the incense upon the fire before the Lord, the fire that's on the altar of incense, that the cloud of incense may cover the mercy seat that's upon the testimony that he die not. So the fragrance actually went past, past that thick veil that separated the holy place from the holiest place, and the incense, the odor went over there to cover the mercy seat, which is saying if God God's going to show mercy, he has to be pleased to do it. God can't show mercy in a state of wrath. Even though the prophet one time said, in wrath, remember mercy, he said. The idea is that while God's wrath is flaming out, mercy doesn't like mingle with it. Mercy proceeds from an atmosphere in which God is well pleased, God is satisfied, God is good. It proceeds from that, and this is a picture of it here in the tabernacle, the mercy seat. Keep this cloud of sweet incense. It's almost like he was saying that'll help God to forget what the people really are. <laughs> because the people are stiff-necked, you know, and rebellious. And this, uh, this God's saying that I'm going to, in the time to come, I'm going to make arrangements for something that will cover the iniquity of the people. There's got to be something that gets God's mind off of the sinful people. This was a mirror here. But Christ really did. Amen. <laughs> he really did make people pleasing Amen. to God. Took away sin. Gave a frank, sweet fragrance to it. So this was uh, something activity that took place in the holy place in the environment. Illumination, bread, fragrance. Now there was the most holy place. Notice the most holy is smaller than the holy. And this area wasn't an area to work in. This wasn't a work area. This was an area where God made himself known area. It's a little bit a little bit different. The first was the everyday work hard, the other once in a while you get this God speaks to you. And if God spoke to you at any other time, you had to stand outside the separation veil and God would speak from inside. That's that's where God really spoke, was in the most holy place. It was fifteen by fifteen, a cube. And the scripture says this of it, Thou shalt put the mercy seat upon the ark of the testimony in the most holy place. So that was the only piece that was in there. It appears as though it uh, pretty well filled that, filled that area. Contained the ark of the covenant. When once a year the high priest could go in here one time a year. That was all. One time a year. Can you imagine? Kept this structure, built it, carried it, made sure it was clean, made sure these fragrances there, but only one time a year they could go in on only one person. The high priest, once a year. The scriptures speak about this. Hebrews 9, 7 hearkens us back to it. And, uh, and tells us that once a year he went into the holy place. One time a year. And several other scriptures speak of this too. Exodus 30, verse 10. Aaron shall make an atonement upon the horns of it once in a year with the blood of the sin offering of atonements. Once in a year shall he make atonement upon it throughout your generations. That's the horns that were on the uh, altar of incense. 
Leviticus 16, 2, The Lord said unto Moses, Speak unto Aaron thy brother, that he come not at all times into the holy place within the veil, before the mercy seat, which is upon the ark, that he die not, for I will appear in a cloud upon the mercy seat. So don't be, don't be coming into my presence. Don't be coming where I am, God said unto the law. Don't be coming where I am. You ought to thank God that that isn't what he says now. Amen. Not since Christ is here. You remember at Mount Sinai, God told Moses, tell the people not to come near. Don't, don't come near. Law puts you in a distance from God. But he told the high priest, the high priest, don't, don't come near here. Leviticus 16, 34, This shall be an everlasting statute unto you to make an atonement for the children of Israel for all the sins once a year. And then the Hebrews 9, 7 kind of clarifies it for us. But into the second, that's the holiest place, went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. So he, he went in, he made an appeal to God at the altar of business and stepped inside this thick veil one time a year before the Lord, by himself, the high priest, nobody with him, to make atonement for the sins of the people. And that took place in the on the Day of Atonement, which is outlined in the 16th chapter of Leviticus, which is a lengthy, <laughs> lengthy chapter. Atonement for sin was made one time a year, every year, year after year. In Christ Jesus, we have a single atonement that was made. Mm -hmm. And the scriptures also tell us that this was a place of communion, where God communicated in this most holy place. Exodus 25, 22 says, There... I will meet with thee, and I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherub, cherubims, which are upon the ark of the testimony, of all things which I will give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. So God says of Moses and Aaron, when I'm going to direct you what to do, I'm going to talk to you from, over, from a cloud that hovers over the mercy seat from between the cherubims. What is all the filters, so to speak? This is... This is going through. God speaking through a cloud it kind of obscures everything. From over the mercy seat, which is a, I'm going to, it's a mercy that I'm talking to you. And I'm going to speak through these cherubims. They're like another filter that the word's coming down to you. And then whenever I'm going to direct you, this is how this word's going to happen. I'm not going to direct you out here in the outer court. This, this is where it's going to happen. I'm not going to direct you in the holy place here. Where the candlestick is, and where, where the showbread is, and where the altar of incense is, that's, that's not going to be where I'm going to direct you either. I want to direct you from this most holy place. Now, you should really be able to see where we're going here. Yeah. <laughs> going here with us, that it, you, you work for God, and God expects us to work for Him, but this isn't where the communion takes place. The communion takes place in His presence, where His mercy is. Amen. Now, in addition, the veil of separation which separated these two compartments was in there. It's uh, mentioned in Exodus 26 and verse 33. And thou shalt hang up the veil under the tashes, or clasps, that thou mayest bring in thither within the veil the ark of the testimony, and the veil shall divide unto you between the holy place and the most holy. So that was this veil separated. It was very thick. Jewish tradition says it was about the thick of a breadth of a hand. So four, five, six inches thick, they estimate. Elaborately woven, you couldn't see through it. It was your vision couldn't penetrate through this. You couldn't, uh, it wasn't like a thin veil you, you could see through at all. So the, there was the uh, holy place, the most holy place, with this thick veil between them. One place you traffic in every day. Another place you traffic once a year. How is how's that? In the same building, in the same building was some place the priests were in every day, and one place only one person, high priest, went once a year. So it should tell you something about God that every place you serve God is not the same. Jesus taught in the temple every day. That's what Luke says. In the daytime, he taught in the temple. It's like the holy place. In the night, he said he prayed in the garden. That's like the most holy place. He, he got into a place where he's closer to God, where there's more direct communion. Amen. Even though when they worked for God, and 
there's a great joy in it. In a sense, there's a little bit of distraction in it. I'm talking about legitimate work for God. There's a little bit of distraction in it. Not sinful distraction, but it's the type of thing you can't concentrate fully upon the Lord, as you can when you're alone with Him, like the Lord was alone. He'd go out and pray alone with the Lord. That was pictured in this most holy place. Now let's take this, that's just the historical facts of the case. Let's look at the new covenant realities that are fulfilled in this. <clears throat> now first of all, in the tabernacle, everybody couldn't serve in here. We didn't rotate the various uh, captains of the tribes and this sort of thing. A special people served in the tabernacle. A special group of people served God. Now in Christ Jesus, this is exactly what happens. God has ordained a special people to serve him. Now it's not clergy, that's not it. It's the saved themselves, the body of Christ. They're like the priests. That God has ordained to serve God. Think of, think of the tabernacle when you read something like this in 1 Thessalonians 1.9. For they themselves show unto us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve. The living and true God. Now you think of this holy place. That was we're serving. God, special people. <laughs> Hebrews 9:14 says, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Amen. That's all God's people. They're like they're like priests. That are serving God. Now, in the serving of God, they are under in the holy place, special clothes were worn. You just couldn't go in your everyday clothes there. Well, it's the same with serving God today. God has provided some special clothing for us to serve Him. You read about it in words like this: As many of you have, have as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. That's quite an interesting thing to pursue, just of itself. Have put on. Christ. Now, this, these are like the coats that God covered Adam and Eve with in the garden. Remember, they first they first made fig leaves, aprons. That'd be like a difference between a, a coat and a bikini. You know, they made aprons to clothe themselves. Although I have a pretty good idea that Adam and Eve they were probably pretty full aprons that they made. And God gave them coats of skin that covered their whole person. In other words, their whole person was covered. This is how Christ is. When you put on Christ, he covers your whole, your whole person. Because God, uh, un until you're home at last with him, you've got to have a covering when you come before God. You, you really do. And so he provides that. Put on Christ. Or here's Ephesians 6, 11. Put on the whole armor of God. It's clothing. It's his clothing to serve God. This, this has to be done. A person can't casually serve God with the world in their mind and mind wandering and this sort of thing. You can't do that. Put on the whole armor of God, clothing. Or how about this, 1 Peter 5, 5. Be clothed with humility. You want to serve God? You put yourself in the background. You just put yourself into the background. It is not I that live, but Christ that lives in me. And the point I'm showing here is that God introduced these ideas way back in the tabernacle. That when you when you serve God, you want to you have to be attired properly. Your particularly your soul, your spirit, your mind has to be attired with proper clothing, special clothing, and. Serving the Lord, there must be a, it's a special environment. It requires a special environment. Now back here in the tabernacle, the special environment that was required was it had to be a place of illumination. It was an enclosed area, but it had to be lit up. It couldn't be dark. And there had to be food in there that would eventually be eaten. And there had to be a fragrance in there. Now this is the kind of environment we serve God in now. See, you've got to see this. There's a... It's in a realm of illumination. God isn't served by ignorance. That is by a, just an empty routine. It isn't, he isn't served this way. The book of, of Hebrews, the sixth chapter in verse 4 says, speaking of our conversion, we were once enlightened. It's like we stepped into the area with a candlestick. Where the candlestick was. Or Hebrews, the tenth chapter in verse 32 Called her, called her, remembers the former days in which after you were illuminated, 
who stepped into the area that was lit up. Or Ephesians 5, 17, be not unwise, but understanding in their spiritual life what the will of the Lord is. So serving God requires enlightenment or illumination. You can't serve him by rote. You can see why he had to have a literal candlestick here. Very little was known about God by these people. Because God had revealed very little of himself to them. Just sort of the borders of his garments, you might say. For his feet, the afterglow of his glory. That's the most they saw. They had very little understanding of God. So he shows, but when he's showing here that in the time of Christ, my people are going to serve me with their, with their understanding, with perception, with insight. See, knowing what's had, knowing the will of the Lord. That's how God is served. So if you're ever tempted to serve God in a state of ignorance, not knowing what you're talking about, not quite understanding whatever things about, if you're ever tempted to attempt to serve God in that way, just like don't do it. God won't accept this. Just as surely as God wouldn't accept a priest's work in the holy place with the candle out and the bread not on the table and the incense not there, he wouldn't accept work like that. So God will not accept work, service, unto him that's not done in the environment of understanding and illumination. That's the way God is. That's the way he is. And in Christ he's provided for that kind of environment. And it's an environment of nourishment, like for bread, always before him. The Lord Jesus said, man shall live by every word of God. I like the way Luke says it, Luke 4.4. 4. Matthew says, every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Luke says, man shall live by every word of God. The person who serves God has to be himself nourished. Yes. The priest that served God had to himself eat that bread every seven days. He had, I'm not sure he ate it all on the, in one day, but every seventh day he got his supply of food for the supply of bread for the rest of the week. He had to eat that. And he had to eat it in the holy place, the scripture says, too, incidentally. You have to nourish your soul if you're going to serve God. This is why a person who, who works for God, say, say they're preaching, they're teaching, whatever, and so they, they mix something up real quick Saturday night. They really ought to just leave it at home. Mm -hmm. Really, I'm very serious. They just at the last minute, they kind of, you want to serve God, minister for God, how, whatever you're going to do with a state of good spiritual health, where you've been nourished and fed and built up in the most holy faith. That's the kind of environment God has served in. And there's a sense that the Word of God says something like this, take heed to yourself and unto the doctrine, and continue in them, for in so doing thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Feel nourished up. Or nourished up with the words of faith. First Timothy 4, 6 tells us. Nourishment. Or feed the flock of God. Why? So they can serve God. That's why so they can serve God. It isn't so they can just be fat. So they can serve God. God is served in a state of nourishment. And he served in a realm of in the realm of fragrance, fragrance, Jesus Christ offered himself to God a sweet smelling savor. Ephesians 5 2. He's, he's to salvation what the altar of incense was to the tabernacle. It's a sweet fragrance. If you really want to be pleasing and acceptable when you come before God, you, God's got to be thinking about Jesus when he sees you. He's got to see Christ in you. He's got, Christ has got to be being formed in you. You've got to have Christ put on. Christ, Christ has to be dominating your thinking. That's, that's what pleases God. God isn't pleased. Brothers and sisters, God isn't pleased by anybody else. He's the one man God's pleased with, the man Christ yeah, Jesus. Right. And when you come before him, if, if you're pleased with Christ, God will be pleased with you. That's, that's the way it works. <laughs> and I, I kind of glory in the simplicity of it. 2 Corinthians 2.15, now think of it, how, how, what this says. For we, we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ, in them that are saved and in them that perish. To the one we are a savor of death unto death, to the other a savor of life unto life. And who's sufficient for these things? Well, what's, what's he saying? He said, Christ in you has produced a response in people that know you. 
or to whom you have spoken. For some people it's made them worse because they, didn't, they don't have any appetite for Christ. Even that was a sweet savor unto God. And some people they became the better because of you. They were a savor of life unto life because Christ was in you. Christ was the savoring ingredient. So in serving of God there has to be this fragrant aroma of the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> And, of course, there's another reference to this sort of incense in Revelation, the 8th chapter, verses 3 and 4. In this particular text, there's uh, prayers of the saints are mentioned. Another angel came and stood at the altar, having the golden, inc golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar before the throne. So here's... Here's the altar that was pictured by this tabernacle, actually mentioned in, in heaven. And there's sweet incense fragrance going up, and, the, and it mingles with the prayers of the prayers of the saints. A marvelous picture. The, the incense itself has to do with Christ, in particular his sacrifice. So you think of the sacrifice of Christ as mingling with your prayers. That's what makes your prayers pleasing. <laughs> Isn't that a beautiful, a beautiful picture? <coughs> Your prayers come from your heart, but more than that, they come, they're mingled with Christ. Christ is in them, and that's what makes them pleasing to God. The <coughs> point in all of this is that you're, uh, when you're serving God, these things have to be present. Illumination, or enlightenment, or understanding, or the absence of ignorance. There has to be a sense of nourishment being built up, growing in grace and truth, feeding on the good things of God. And a sense of fragrance where Christ saturates your person, where something about Christ is seen in you, in your, in your attitude, in your words, in your deeds, Christ is mirrored in them. And there's also a sense of your own work which becomes pleasing to God. Colossians 1.10, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. So it's possible for your work to be fragrant and pleasing to the Lord. In fact, John said, Whatsoever we ask, we receive of him, because we keep his commandments and do those things pleasing in his sight. What, what is something that's pleasing in God's sight? Is it something that you just adhere to the letter of the law, as I used to think? Is that really what makes your works ex acceptable? Is it that it adheres to the letter of the law? Well, make no mistake about it, nothing's going to be pleasing. It violates the letter of the law, I know this. But the thing that makes your work pleasing isn't that it stick strictly with the rules is that it's got Christ in it. It's Christ in you that's the hope of glory. And as Christ is in you, it, it flavors your work up so that it's pleasant unto the Lord. Now in a more intimate detail, Christ himself now is in the most holy place. We are in the holy place now. See, in, in Christ, we're in this first section, the holy place, where the work is done where the light is needed, where the food is needed, where the fragrance is needed, that's where we're at. But Jesus, he's in the most holy place. That's where he is. He's where the real direct communication is taking place. Now the scripture teaches this. Hebrews the 8th chapter and verse 1. Now the things as we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such a high priest who is set at the right hand of God, in of the, of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. So that's the real, <laughs> the real most holy places in heaven, and that's where Jesus is right now. Hebrews, the ninth chapter, verse 11 says, Christ has become a high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, which the Lord pitched and not man neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having made obtained eternal redemption for us. Now, for, uh, for several years of my life in Christ, which has now been 51 years, it's quite a blessing itself, been in Christ long, much longer than I was in the world. I can remember the day when I was in Christ longer than I was in the world. That was quite a, quite a blessing. But now, in this area, Christ, uh, Christ has entered into this most holy place to appear in the presence of God for us. I can remember that for many years of my initial life in Christ, 
I thought very little about what Christ was doing now. I only thought about what Christ did when he died, when he rose, when he ascended. It kind of my thinking kind of stopped there. I don't, th I don't know that there. I can't put my finger on precisely why it did, but I just didn't do a lot of thinking about what Christ is doing now. But what Christ is doing now is his most important work. That's where his death is being applied now. See, when they killed the bullock out here and the goats and the ram for the Day of Atonement, they had to take the blood inside the most holy place. And that's where it became effective. Now what Jesus' death became effective when he took it, took his blood into the very presence of God, into the most holy place. And what he's doing now is doing for us what the Day of Atonement did for Israel. The Day of Atonement, they couldn't have survived without this. Now it had to be a repeated day. Every year they repeated it again, over and over, year after year, at least 40 years in the wilderness. At least 40. There were at least 40 Day of Atonements just in the wilderness journeys alone. But Jesus, one time, he ended one time, mm -hmm. his death was so effective, Amen. no more deaths necessary. Amen. No more bloodshed necessary. That's how effective it was. That's how pleased God was. It was, it was to God what this blood and light and bread on the altar and the altar of incense, he's all of that wrapped up in one. It all pleases God. God is greatly pleased with what Jesus has done. In fact, he said before he died, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Very well pleased. And even more so now that he's entered into heaven. So Christ now is ministering in heaven in our behalf. He's interceding for us. He's mediating the new covenant. Now he's a different kind of mediator. You understand he's a different kind of mediator. He's not a mediator like Moses was. Moses was a mediator between God and the people. But Moses kept the wrath from coming on the people. That's how he mediated. That's how he mediated. He, Lord, don't, don't destroy him. <laughs> That's not how Jesus mediates. Jesus mediates by bringing things from God to us. This is how he mediates. He's taking the benefits of the covenant and bringing them to the people. He's, but he's doing it from heaven. He's not doing it from earth. He's doing it from heaven in the most holy, most holy place. You see, you've got to get this perspective. That working for God is good. But Jesus working for you is better. <laughs> That's the thing that makes your work acceptable. Yes. So Jesus is presently in the holy place working for us, which makes our work accept acceptable. In fact, the scripture says that we draw nigh to God by what Jesus did. We draw nigh to God. That's the contrast with your work. Now see, I, you, I, I want you to see this, that in this holy place they did a lot of work. A lot of work. But when they came into the most holy place, they didn't do a lot of work. The main thing was drawing near. Now, your main job is to get close to God. God, Jesus died so you could get in the most holy place. This is where God wants people. In the most holy place. Not just in the holy place. To draw near. Near to God. Close to Him. In fact, the scripture says this, The law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did, by the which we draw nigh to God. Hebrews 10.22 says, Let us draw near. Let's talk about this holiest place. See? Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Or James said, Draw nigh to God, and he'll draw nigh to you. Now back under the law, you draw, went into the holiest place, and then God in the clouds spoke. That's how he drew near then. But <laughs> that's not to compare with what he does now, brothers and sisters. Now the objective is to get into the most holy, holy place. That's what Hebrews 10.19 says. We want to grow, come into the holiest where God is all consuming. Where nothing else, your vision, your understanding isn't mixed with anything else. It's God and God himself through Christ Jesus. You're not occupied with what you do, what you should do, what you didn't do, what you ought to do. It's not that. It's God. It's the all-consuming vision. That's where your power lies. That's where the power lies. The more conscious you are of God, the more powerful you are. The least conscious you are of God, the least powerful you are. The more assured that you are that you're in God's presence, the more sufficient you become. The least assured you are, the least 
sufficient you become. Into the holiest place. Now the old covenant kept men out of the holiest. Once a year. One man. The new covenant brings you into the holiest of all. Back when Jesus died, you remember that veil that was in the temple? It was the veil that in the tabernacle separated the holy from the holy place. It was torn in two from scriptures, all three gospels. I'm very careful to say this. From the top to the bottom. It was God-like. <laughs> torn it open. And what he is saying was the way to me and I was open. You can come to me now. You can come to me now. In the words of Scripture, you can come to find mercy, find uh, mercy and grace to help at the time of need. You you can come near. But if it hadn't have been for if it hadn't been for Jesus' death and for Jesus now, we couldn't we couldn't do that. The place of communion is the most holy place. Now, I know that uh, as you serve God. There's a certain realization of God and fellowship that does take place in that. I understand that. But the, that's not the sustaining, the sustaining communion. The sustaining communion is when it's just God and you. That's the sustaining communion. Here we'll, we have edification one with another. No, and it's of great benefit. But the design of this edification is to enable you yourself to come into the presence of God. That's where you receive your real, your real strength in His presence. So working for God is good and necessary. But getting into the presence of God is, a, is the most essential thing where you have the benefit of hearing from God and being directed by Him. So the holy place and the most holy place, a place to work and a place to commune, a place of activity where you are the, what you do is the main thing, in the holiest, what God did was the main, main thing. And may God direct your steps so that you will become more familiar.